Um, my name is Ed Dorrell. I'm oh, deputy hi. editor of the TES. Um, on behalf of the TES, I'd like to welcome you all here. What a fantastic tribute it is to your commitment to be here so early on a Saturday morning. I presume there are one or two hangovers knocking around. Um, so this is the question time session. I'd like to introduce you to our panel. On the end, we have Tristram Hunt. He is Shadow Secretary of State for Education, a one-time lecturer, a historian, a TV historian, an author, and according to William Hill, 10 to 1 to be the next leader of the Labour Party. <laughs> um, Natalie Bennett, who uh, has had an interesting week, should we say, <laughs> uh, probably doesn't need any introductions now, but a one-time Guardian journalist, uh, leader of the Green Party, candidate for Hoban and St Pancras, which, if she were to win, would make her constituency MP for the IOE, the TES, the NUT, art schools, any number of world-class HE institutions. So MP for education, I guess, you'd be. And last but not least, we have Sam Gima. Gima. Gima, I'm sorry. Um, who is Under Secretary of State in the Department for Education, a uh, one-time businessman, young entrepreneur of the year, I believe. When I was much younger, yeah. <laughs> um, among, uh, you know, a hugely interesting CV. There is the inevitable, of course, PP from Oxford, for, which I think is essential. But I believe you were schooled in Ghana for a while as well, which I imagine gives you an interesting perspective on education. Um, so before we get into some questions, a little bit of house rules, I suppose. Um, this is going to be question time. We're going to try and follow as much as we can the way the TV show is run. So what I want from you guys are short, sharp questions which are relevant to our entire panel, so I don't want you interrogating details of individual party pol policy. I want, you, I want the questions to be answerable by all three of our fantastic panel. They've got to be quick. I'll cut you off if they're not quick. <laughs> Similarly, I reserve the right to hassle you guys if I think you're waffling or you're not answering the question. Um, other housekeeping, I believe the hashtag is LFE15, hashtag LFE15. If we could get it trending today, that would be brilliant. Um, so anyway, I will ask a couple of warm-up questions just to get us going. First of all, this is question time, so I'm thinking of another TV program, Mastermind. If you were going to be on Mastermind, what would your specialist subject be? Sam. Business. Business, my bad. <laughs> Natalie? Um, women in Tudor, London. Uh, Tristram? Uh, it would be Friedrich Engels in Manchester, circa 1850 to circa 1870. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you thought about that before, didn't you? <laughs> um, and one other warm-up, and we're not doing pitches, we're not doing five minutes like this, but you're all going to be campaigning a lot, you're probably campaigning now, on the doorstep, you knock on the door, answering it is a pissed-off angry teacher who says, mm -hmm. I'm going to give you 30 seconds, what will your party do for education? 30 seconds. Natalie, go. Okay. Well, what we need to do is stop our schools being exam factories that push pupils through exam after exam after exam and, and force teachers to um, you know, fill in vast amounts of paperwork, often to no purpose. We want to bring um, free schools and academies back under local authority control. Uh, we want to abolish performance-related pay, and we want to bring in, bring in free tuition and universities. Education is a public good. Doors closed. Good. Tristram. Uh, we want to work with you to raise the attainment of the poorest students. Um, we want to stretch the brightest. We want to have qualified teachers in the classroom, and we make a symbol of the importance of qualification uh, for teachers. We want schools to partner, collaborate and challenge one another to raise standards so that the extraordinary success of the London Challenge is replicated around the country. We will end the free schools programme to ensure that we have planning, coordination uh, across Doors the school in place. Doors closing. And that's why, madam, it's always a pleasure to see a Labour voter on Saturday morning. <laughs> and Sam, last but not least. Well, the most important thing from my education system is children and what comes out of it. I am very proud that one million children are now studying in good and outstanding schools. 
This would not be possible without the hard work of teachers who are on the front line. We want to work with you to continue to deliver on this, um, on this success. And that means more freedom for head teachers, more freedom for you, the teachers, but also um, raising the standards in school overall. And that means, yes, there are children of different abilities. Yes, children, but we also need to make sure that whatever their ability, they come out of the school with the core subject, the subject knowledge they need English and maths, because that is what will prepare them for life in modern Britain, and you are essential to us achieving that as a teacher. Thank you. Right, I believe there are some roving mics knocking around. Can you wave them at me? All right, questions from the audience. Let's go straight into it. I see one there. Down at the front. The, the mic's coming towards you. <coughs> Remember, short, sharp, and to the point. And for My name all is Patricia Pelitza from Thomas Education. I would like to know... What are your plans to help school uh, developing employability skills? So employability skills. Um, what are your plans to help schools deliver employability skills? Developing, developing employability skills. Developing employability. Sam? Presumably for the children, that's what you're talking about. Yes, of course, yes. <laughs> what else? <laughs> Great. Um, it's, it's a very good question. Just, um, teachers, I believe, should be focusing on doing what they do best, which is teaching and really raising the standards um, of our children in schools. Schools are not where you go to learn to become an investment banker or a musician or whatever it is. School is where you go to gain knowledge, and that is absolutely important. But we, so we, want, but we also want people to come out of the school system prepared for life in modern Britain. And the way we are approaching it is through an employer-led uh, system where we would um, employ led company where we would get them to work with schools to provide the careers advice and guidance that there is and I remember when I was at school and I asked my history teacher to whom I owe a huge debt of gratitude um, it was a distinct school in um, Hertfordshire and thinking about my a levels university degree I happened to be that kind of kid and I said I'd quite like to be a lawyer what do you think I should do to become a lawyer and thinking back, that's a huge question to ask someone who is a brilliant history teacher to give me guidance at the age of 18 in terms of how to do this. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is why we should put employers in the driving seat to work with schools to be able to deliver the right career advice and guidance. Because careers are changing all the time. There are jobs that exist today that didn't exist when I was a pupil, and there are jobs that would exist in 10 years' time. And we can't expect teachers to stay ahead of that curve to give that guidance. It's got to be through employer-led careers companies. Thank you, sir. Sister. Um, we will introduce the uh, statutory instrument for work experience. So work experience has been removed by this government. We will introduce it. Uh, we will uh, reintroduce careers information and guidance. This government has destroyed careers information and guidance. We will reintroduce that. We will have world-class, high-quality technical and vocational qualifications. We will introduce a technical baccalaureate, which is actually a certificate uh, and has vocational qualifications within it. We will have English and Maths 218, so post-16 core English and Maths uh, qualifications. Uh, and we will uh, make sure that the quality of teaching we need in our further education colleges uh, is also preparing people uh, for the workplace. We're also very, very passionate about getting, like Sam, businesses involved with schools so that we're getting particularly girls in primary schools having their horizons raised about what they're capable of achieving with work immersion, work experience, making that a normal part uh, of what young girls are experiencing, that they can be architects, they can be doctors, um, and getting it and beginning it at primary. Uh, so yes, you get, you get the basics right, but we also need to go further. Work experience, careers guidance, technical vocational qualification. <laughs> Natalie. I think you've got to be very careful when you're thinking about what does employability skills mean because I think we need to go a step back in a way because what we need schools to be is a preparation for life and at the moment the narrowing of the focus on uh, subjects that are examined, uh, narrowly academic subjects, has really put enormous pressure on a broader range of subjects and so that means many of you may know that Caroline Lucas currently has a private members bill to, uh, seeking to make P PSHE, Personal, Social, Health and Economic Education, a statutory requirement. And preparing people to set them up for life, for the skills to have a successful, productive, uh, effective life is really one of the areas where schools 
you know, are simply really variable, and that's not fair to our pupils. And of course, sex and relationship education is a really important part of that too. In terms of the involvement of employers in schools, I think we have to be really, really careful. As Sam said, the nature of uh, work these days changes really rapidly. And in really gross cases, we've seen examples of you know, sponsorship by local businesses of schools. And, and there's a real direction of, you know, this is going to prepare you to go and work in the local business. Will it still be there? Will there be whole new jobs that you should be doing different kind of jobs? What we need to do, to do is prepare pupils for life, give them lots and lots of skills, personal skills, technical skills, but not think of school as a place where you prepare, you walk out the door and get a job the next day, okay. because the world just doesn't work like that. Exactly. Um, what I didn't expect was the first question to see agreement between the Conservatives and the Green Party. <laughs> So, let's see what else we can get. <laughs> Who's up next? I can see a lady. I didn't think there was agreement. We, yeah. we believe employers should be involved. She doesn't believe employers okay. should be involved. I don't think there's agreement. Hello, Alison Morgan, teacher in, the, in outer London, um, but speaking in a personal capacity. What my two big questions are, where are you getting your advice from when you put your policies <laughs> together? <laughs> This is a great question. The question was, to all three of you, where are you getting your advice oh, from? Can I, no, I really do have to have a second one. On that because no, my point is, no, no. what are we going to do to stop teachers leaving, the massive numbers of younger okay. teachers who are leaving, because you're not listening to people who actually do the job do and understand Tristram, where do you get your advice from? Yesterday, I got my advice from Oak Hill Primary School in Stoke-on-Trent, where I met the head teacher and the teachers. I then got my advice from Our Lady St. Benedict Primary School in Stoke-on-Trent, where I met the head teacher, the teachers and the uh, pupils. I then got my advice from the head teacher of Stoke-on-Trent Sixth Form College and the head of politics, uh, Martha Stevens, in Stoke-on-Trent. I then got my advice from Carl Hayward, who's the head teacher, uh, uh, sorry, Carl Hayward, from the head teacher of Hayward Academy in Stoke on Trent. So I think yesterday I probably met around 15 teachers, head teachers, and from all of them I gained insight, knowledge and advice. And I will then take other advice from Kevin Courtney from the NUT, from Chris from the NSUWT, from Chris Husbands uh, here at the Institute uh, of Education, uh, from Frontline when I'm thinking about social work, from Teach First when I'm also thinking about teachers. I get advice from as many interesting, creative, innovative people as possible on the front line, in the think tanks, in academia. Um, and that's exactly right, I think. Okay, Natalie. Um, uh, I, I suppose to start with, where does Green Party policy come from? And Green Party policy is democratically made by the members of the Green Party. That is informed by evidence. One of the things the Green Party prides itself on is making evidence-based policy. So what we, those members, uh, the people who are shaping our policy, look to do is look at what the best, uh, most recent uh, evidence from around the world is. So, for example, one of the reasons why we believe that formal education should start at least one year later is there's evidence from around the world that that actually is better for pupils, better for students. Um, in terms of my personal experience, well, I'm actually a, um, a governor at Netley Primary, which is just on the other side of uh, Euston Road here. Uh, I, spent, I spent an hour and a half on Thursday at the uh, premises meeting. I know an awful lot about school buildings, particularly. <laughs> um, uh, we've, we've just had a whole, uh, half the school rebuilt, so it's an, it's an enormous amount of fun. Um, but basically, what we aim to do is base it on the evidence, and then we go to our members of the Green Party. There's now 54,000 members, 54,500 members of the Green Party, a lot of them are teachers, and we also very much talk to the unions. And you know, there's a, there's a whole range of manifestos around for this election from the unions. We can sign up to pretty well everything in them. And as I said, one of the important issues is statement. performance related pay. You know, is 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 a key issue. Okay, thank you, Sam. <laughs> well, I mean, if Tristram is speaking to that many teachers and head teachers a day, I sort of wonder how he ended up with his policy of a Hippocratic Oath for teachers, which, as far as I'm aware, no teacher really wants. Um, the, Alison, it's a very good question, and the reason why it's a brilliant question is when it comes to education policy, everyone has a view because everyone has been to school before. 
right? And when I go to uh, dinner with friends or whatever, everyone has a view of what we should be doing about education in their local area. So it's very challenging making policy. And I believe that education policy should take into account the views of all the stakeholders affected by education. So, for example, giving parents, Christian would like to call them yummy mummies, the freedom to set up a school where they feel there isn't a good quality school in their area or provision is not working, I think it is right to take into account the views of parents. Secondly, I would say when it comes to developing a school-led improvement system, it is right to have teachers and schools working together to deliver that system. And it's right to get the unions involved, and we know the unions are very involved in us developing that school-led improvement system. But when it comes to teacher workload, which is something that we know is a real concern, we've just had a consultation, and 44,000 teachers have responded to that consultation, and we'll be taking the appropriate action as a result of that. So we need to take into account all of the stakeholders affected uh, by education. It's parents, it's the unions who represent staff, it's the teachers, it's the head teachers. We need to take all of that into account, but we also need to be aware of what is happening internationally and get some of the best practice. And that is what our academies and free school system is about. Thank you, Sam. More qu oh, look at the hands shoot up. Should we take, should we take, a, should we take a round? Uh, sorry? Should we take them in three? I was going to say two or three, yeah, in the time. It's got no. It's got hand. Okay. I'll get my hands. Um, there's two next to each other at the back. Let's take them together. Well, half, two thirds of the way up. Thank you. My name's Rowena Passy. I'm from Plymouth University, and we run Natural Connections Demonstration Project for DEFRA. What are you going to do to support outdoor learning in schools? Support outdoor learning in schools. Hi, I'm Joel Cohen from the Institute of Ideas. Um, in light of the kind of uh, the three uh, girls from Bethnal Green, uh, in who, who who you know made their journey to uh, Turkey this week, I'd like to ask if you think schools have a responsibility uh, for the you know political views uh, of their students, and if the answer to that question uh, is yes, then I'd kind of like to know how you square that with what you've all said uh, about letting teachers just teach and, uh, and you know engage in their subject. Should we start with outdoor learning? <laughs> <laughs> Which might give you a minute or two to think. <laughs> Natalie, outdoor learning. Um, Surely an issue close to the heart. Uh, very, very much green. an issue, issue close to the heart. And I think you know, one of the key things we have to do is make sure that all schools have decent, adequate outdoor space. And that's been a real issue in terms of some of the free schools. And that's something we really need to, to guarantee um, children the ability to ru run around. And actually, this is, this is again very close to my own heart with Netley because of our building program, which has, of course, overrun. Uh, we've had you know, restricted space and we've just been able to open up more space and it's brilliant to see how happy the children are with that space. And you know, we've really seen physical education in particular cut away, getting a little less focus, and that's terribly important. But we also need to give children the opportunity to have contact with the natural world and there's a lot of evidence for children and adults that contact with the natural world is good for your health and well-being and that's something we need to ensure is part of every school curriculum. Sam. <coughs> Outdoor learning. Um, <laughs> I think the, 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 the way I would answer that is it's not really for a bureaucrat or a politician to prescribe the way in which a creative, passionate and enthusiastic teacher would um, bring a subject to life uh, for their children. So that is why I firmly believe in freedom for head teachers and freedom for teachers to be able to uh, do this sort of thing. So I'm not going to try and prescribe um, specifically um, how, what to do in that respect. In terms of the question on Bethnal Green, uh, Bethnal, Bethnal Green School, I think what we've got to be. So we, I think we'll um, come back to that. We'll do oh, the outdoor okay. learning and then we'll go on to the Bethnal Green School because that's a. Uh, Sure. Can of worms, which I think we can talk through quite a lot. Um, Tristram, outdoor learning. Uh, I, I think outdoor learning is really, really important. Um, all the things that we want to develop um, in, in our students about character, grit, resilience, teamwork, social and emotional competency, outdoor learning is really, really significant within that. And I go to too many schools where kids from disadvantaged backgrounds haven't 
felt <laughs> sand beneath their feet, haven't felt natural running water, all those experiences which are many of us take for granted are really, really valuable in the development and enrichment of children. And I'm always so happy when I see pupil premium money spent really well on outdoor learning and trips and visits. So, and when I, I was, the kids I was talking to yesterday, they said, well, you know, what do you remember about your school days? And you remember the school trips, you remember the outdoor learning, you remember the experiences surrounding of that. And, and all of the academic evidence now suggests that uh, it is really, really important in the learning development of kids. So, all the push that we're making on character, resilience and development uh, and a Labour commitment to having a broad and balanced curriculum. No school will be outstanding under a Labour government without a broad and balanced curriculum. And I think we see part of that uh, as having uh, outdoor learning uh, and the enrichment it builds. So I think, I think it's a hugely important part of our uh, education system. Then, <laughs> we talk about Bethnal Green School. This is the London Festival of Education. You know, this is an issue that will be on in the minds of hundreds of thousands of teachers all around the country, but specifically in London, the whole issue of radicalisation. The question specifically, as I understood it, was to what extent are schools responsible for the political opinions of their pupils? S schools, schools have what? a very significant responsibility in terms of safeguarding and protection. Um, <laughs> But everything we know about this case is that in terms of the students at school, their activities at school, their work at school, their views at school, nothing was coming up uh, on uh, the, the radar for the teachers. And in fact, what was happening was the radicalization outside of uh, school through social media, through other uh, networks. So we put a lot on teachers, and quite rightly, we put a lot on uh, head teachers, but we also have to be aware, just as with their own parents, you know, they can't uh, do everything. Um, and so family, school, mosque, community, all of these elements in a young people's upbringing need to play their part together in order to uh, challenge it. And, you know, we, we, we have to go deeper and further and often in a more sophisticated manner when we think about some of this debate about British values and what it means. Because I've been around enough schools with boards on, with pictures of Her Majesty the Queen and double-decker buses saying these are British values. Uh, and that's not really a sophisticated enough attempt to think about the kind of enlightenment pluralist values which are going to combat this sort of cancerous jihadist ideology which we need to root out in the east end of London as much as in parts of Birmingham. I face challenges in Stoke-on-Trent. So there's, there's work to be done within school and outside of school. Thanks, and Natalie, if you were to win this seat, uh, it would be a pressing issue for many of the schools in your area. It is, but I think if we go back to the question, are schools responsible for the political views of their students? Um, I mean, I, you know, we do not want schools telling people this is your political views. And it's very important to say that. And I think, you know, I pretty much agree with Tristram in terms of, you know, schools, uh, um, you know, what, what happened here, all of the evidence from Bethnal Green is that the, the problem was outside school. So schools can be useful forces to counter, useful uh, institutions to counteract some of those forces, but we can't necessarily hold them responsible if they're not successful against some of those powerful internet forces that we've seen are having an impact around the world, not just in Britain. But, 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 I, but, 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 sorry. The political this, leaders also need to show some leadership on this. Well, well, and I'm you sorry, know, you, you might let me, I let you... national television I, saying it's all right to be a member of the IRA or support ISIS or these... Well, it's well, okay I, to I, have these ideas. That does not send the right message to well, these young people. Well, Do you want to clarify what you're saying, Natalie? Well, I would like to first of all clarify that I've made it very clear that being a member of ISIS or Al-Qaeda is, 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 is very... Well, what we have to do is draw a very clear line between supporting any kind of violent ideology, which, which, is ISIS, which ISIS and ideology... Well, very okay well I've clarified that, su that subsequently. Well, what you, well, tell us what you mean. Well, what I, well, I've clarified very clearly that if you support anything that involves violence, supporting violence... What about views about... Tristram. Tristram. Natalie. Thank you. Um, what we need to do, and to come back to the subject, which is to equip... Um, pupils with critical thinking, abilities to analyse what they're being told, 
and this is a, is a very important issue, a very important part of this. But I think, you know, and this is, so this is a protection issue, very much an issue of child protection, but it's also a, an issue of, of development, of encouraging strong development in our pupils so that they think critically. Um, and that means, you know, thinking about what you're being told, and that's something that schools do have a really important role in. Um, and we also need to make sure that we're helping parents to be part of a supportive community. And we do have to think about what British values means. And, you know, in the, the uh, anniversary, year of the anniversary of Magna Carta, you know, thinking about freedom, human rights, those kind of things, and the way the British state behave, believe, behaves, all of those things are part of what we need to think about and help our pupils think about. Thank you. Sam. <laughs> No, I, I think this is um, an incredibly uh, serious issue, and you've narrowed it down to London. So I think it's <laughs> it's the London Festival, but it is, London, it, it is, it is a, a, a serious issue, and um, quite sad as well. These are not uh, jihadi brides. This is uh, child sexual exploitation um, by another name, and we've got to call it what it is. This is absolutely uh, dreadful. All the evidence uh, from the police so far is that the girls did not get radicalised at school. Um, actually, uh, one girl went um, a few months ago. They were all part of the same group. And obviously, the influences that children are exposed to are not just influences at school. They spend a lot of time on social media, and there are a lot of other ways in which children can get negatively influenced. And, but what can schools do? Schools are not responsible for their political views. Schools are supposed to teach children to engage with issues Critically is what you want, but what schools can do when Tristan mentioned leadership and I think this is an example of leadership is teach children the values that matter to all of us in this country and those values you can mock them British values or not, but I think it is important that we all learn mutual respect at schools mutual respect for other people's views mutual respect for other people's religion tolerance the fact that we live in a country where the rule of law is important and we live in a country where the way we arrive at decisions is through the democratic process. And these are some of the British values that we are making compulsory to be taught in our schools. And that is how I think from the political side we can show leadership and certainly schools can be involved. Not to prescribe a political view, but to really show, demonstrate to these children what values you need if you are going to live and prosper in this country. But this is a big problem. I think it's not going to go away, and we've got further big questions for us. Thank you, Sam. Um, uh, let's go for what, uh, the lady in the back in the orange, just there. Yes, hi. I have a question about British values. I mean, it seems we to have me... sort of done that, have we? No, 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 no. You haven't. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Basically, Good one. I think you're all missing the point here. I mean, you can teach people about tolerance, mutual respect, but nobody's talking about the social economic situation where these problems evolve. So British values seems to me to be in contradiction, right? Values apply for some who have uh, maybe, who are the privileged in society. And, and let's talk about there is a, la a total lack of social mobility and inequality in the country as well. And, and so nobody talks about the social issues that are underpinning these, these problems. So that's a question about social mobility? Yeah. Yeah, OK. And uh, the chap next to you in the black. Thank you. Mark Pritchard, assistant head in a school in Slough. Um, one of the things education needs the most is it for for it to be depoliticized. If you were education secretary, would you be brave enough to do yourself out of a job and hand over power and policy to the professionals? Um, I'm going to take those two. Uh, these are three politicians on stage being asked about depoliticizing education, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, let's start with Sam. <clears throat> OK, uh, I'll take the second question about depoliticization first and come on to the social mobility uh, question. Uh, are we taking both or are we answering you, you one Yeah, take them one at a time. One at a time. Okay. Social mobility and lip specifically linked to extremism. I reject the idea that because of someone's economic circumstance, they cannot understand that mutual respect and tolerance for other people's views is not possible. 
That is just completely wrong. Now, the whole purpose of our education system is that it should be an engine for social mobility, that when people go through our education system, they come out in a position where with hard work, through luck, but also through the skills we've equipped them with at school, that they can make the most of their life. That is what underpins our education system. But let us not deceive ourselves that somehow, when people get exposed to radicalization, travel to other countries, and mean harm for this country, somehow it's because of their economic circumstance in this country. That is completely wrong. Tristram, you're nodding. No, I totally agree with that. I mean, I mean, I, I, I take your, your broader point about thinking about, you know, Britishness and the nature of Britishness. And if you're going to think about that, one can begin to think about, you know, socioeconomic um, fundamentals and the nature of power and the meaning of power. But don't, don't kid yourself for a minute that this vile ideology out there is somehow born of socioeconomic despair. Those drawn to it are often uh, from you know, relatively well-off backgrounds. It's an ideology. It, it, it is a set of ideas, not born of poverty, but born of a, uh, of a, a warped War Islamist mindset. Um, so uh, you know, talking about um, poverty uh, and disadvantage, I'm absolutely up for that conversation. But what is so very interesting is the nature of your question next to your, your colleagues, because if, as it were, you want education to be depoliticised, you want me as a Labour Secretary of State coming in and saying, we're going to talk about the nature in which poverty distorts our society, we're going to introduce a curriculum, uh, you know, pretty much shaped by E.P. Thompson, uh, and then there's going to be an election three years later, and we'll go back to Her Majesty the Queen and double-decker buses uh, and talking about British values uh, on those precepts. So either we want education policy to be relatively depoliticised and actually we want professionals to be in charge of curriculum development or we want each time there's a change of government to have a new curriculum which is why I've said that under a Labour government the primary curriculum stays the same, no change there the GCSE curriculum changes continue, no change there, stability is important but people casting their votes in the general election also have a right to have a voice on education and that's why I said we're not going to go ahead with the A-level changes. So I think, I mean I would say this wouldn't it, but I'm taking a relatively mature approach to stability <laughs> in the education system rather than chopping and changing, despite some of Thank the pressure you. I get from colleagues on the left about, you know, we must bring to a halt everything they've done in the last five years. Sure, sure. Actually, what teachers want to do is get on with the job of teaching and learning and have politicians right, provide on. some stability and structure to that. Natalie. Uh, I, wa I want to draw a line between democratic meddling and democratic accountability and oversight. Um, uh, when I was at school, I still am, uh, I was fascinated by lungfish. I did a huge voluntary project about age 11 on lungfish. Someone has to be, I suppose. Uh, but but, I, but um, I promise that, you know, um, I will never say that everybody has to study lungfish. <laughs> uh, and we've seen far too much of that kind of meddling uh, coming from the top very often. Uh, but we do actually want schools to have democratic oversight and it should be local democratic oversight, which that means oversight from the community. So the professionals, the schools, are left to teach, to set the curriculum. We don't believe in a national curriculum. Uh, but there needs to be that oversight of, of how the school is catering to the community, to the future generations. So there's a balance between meddling and oversight. Um, and in terms of the, the socioeconomic question, I think we need to de decouple this from the, the whole radicalisation question, because I think there isn't a great deal of evidence that the people who are most likely at risk are particularly likely to be most socioeconomically disadvantaged. But we do have huge socioeconomic disadvantage in this society. And one of the things that I you know, want to say very loudly and clearly is, you know, great schools can do wonderful things with pupils who have really tough home lives, where the bedroom tax has made life a misery, where parents are struggling with two and three jobs, minimum wage, trying to make ends meet. Schools can do a lot, but they can't do everything. And the responsibility for ensuring that no child should be living in poverty is society's responsibility. It's not school's job to somehow other miraculously make up the difference for that poverty. 
Sam, you didn't get a chance to talk about depoliticising. <laughs> no, no. And just, just firstly, one point on the uh, social mobility point. I mean, we've introduced the people premium. And the people premium, um, which are 5.6 billion over the course of this parliament, is doing great wonders in helping schools really help those children who need to catch up, who are from less advantaged backgrounds. So that's a point on social mobility. On depoliticisation, I think it's very interesting. And the reason why I think it's an interesting question is um, the academies programme was one that was introduced by the last Labour government. And we thought it was such a good programme that we will take forward Lord Adonis's academies programme. And free schools are academies by another name. Enter um, Tristram Hunt, who says he wants to depoliticise the whole thing and wants to be steady. What does he do? He keeps criticising the academies programme that Labour introduced. And we talk about um, teacher qualifications. There are 4% of teachers who don't have QTS. What does Tristram decide to focus on? The 4% who don't have QTS rather than the 90 support for the 96% of teachers. Now, what the Labour Party have been doing, as far as I've, I got elected in 2010, is on every issue trying to find the minor issue where they disagree to create false dividing lines for political reasons. And we saw that yesterday with the tuition fee pledge. A tuition fee pledge, that's it, is going to go down from 9,000 to 6,000, and it doesn't make, it wouldn't make a single bit of difference to the poor students that are actually at university. So if you want to talk about depoliticizing uh, the education debate, then I'll ask the Labour Party to become clean and s carry on and support the good work we're doing, because, for example, we all want our children to be equipped with good maths and good English, because if, you're maths in, if you don't have your maths in English, you can't get on in life. But the Labour so. Party chooses to focus on something else. And I think so long as if Tristan is willing to agree with what we've done in the same way as we took the best from the Labour years forward, then we will have a much more mature debate on education in this Thank country. So. I'm pleased you mentioned it, so I'm going to go straight in. I'm just going to ask both of you about the, um, the tuition fees policy. Mm -hmm. um, Natalie, where would you be on that? Okay. We believe in zero university tuition fees. Education is a public good that should be paid for from general progressive, far more progressive than it is now, taxation. And we, we shouldn't be leaving our young people going through 30 years of their life with the weight of debt, whichever level of debt you're talking about, mm -hmm. and many of them would still face not being able to pay it off going through 30 years of their life, for many of them from their early to mid-20s to their early to mid-50s, whenever you earn any sort of money at all, paying that 9%, but knowing that you're never going to pay the debt off. Yeah. That's a huge weight on people's lives on the future generation. Thank you. But, Tristan, can you... Have you got the costumes right? <laughs> yes. Right. Um, no, 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 no. no. You're not asking questions of the Green Party. Yeah. You're here to... But, but can you explain? Ed, you should ask the question then, because you can't just say we want everything to be and nice without saying, well, you know, what are the costs of that? Yeah, but can you explain your party, your party policy about six grand, please? So we're just going to let that lie, are we? That, it let, all just be I'm asking the question. Explain yours, explain yours. Uh, we are going to pay for the reduction of tuition fees from 9,000 pounds a year to 6,000 pounds a year. Yeah. Yeah. And that will be tax allowances for pensions. So we think this is a question of intergenerational equity. Uh, we think that we need to invest in our young people whilst also securing our world-class universities. Right around the world, you pay to go to university, quite rightly, because it is an investment for your future and you will earn that money back during your professional career. Uh, and it is only right that you contribute towards that investment. But we went from having uh, relatively competitive uh, tuition fees to uh, the second highest uh, in the world behind America. We think we've seen uh, remarkable assaults on young people for, from this government. The educational maintenance allowance being only part of it, increases of rents, all the rest of it. So the Labour Party takes a progressive view of education, but also takes a sensible view that we know where the money is coming from to make this investment. We invest in our young people uh, by uh, ending some of the more advantageous tax relief systems uh, for the wealthiest in terms uh, of their pension contribution. Costed, progressive, interventionist Labour policy. We're going to move on from this. Can I, can I no, say something? Uh, no, we, we've discussed it enough. There's a chap there in the back and a tie on. Thank you. Uh, Chris Waterman from the Reduced Policy Company. We've heard a lot of vanilla flannel so far this morning. So what I would like is each of the speakers to say which two bullet points, not long sentences, two bullet points, so that 
we will know what separates the parties when we come to choose, or in school admission terms, express a preference for a new government? That seems like a fairly decent question to finish with. So I'm going to go to Tristram. Uh, priority is technical vocational uh, education uh, to make sure that we're training young people for the jobs of the future. Schools collaborating, partnership, challenging one another to raise standards across the country. Thank you. Lovely. Um, uh, we need an education system that prepares pupils for life. Uh, and since it hasn't come up yet, we want to abolish Ofsted. <laughs> <laughs> Sam. How much you put into the education system is important. We will spend £560 million more than the Labour Party on our education system in the next parliament. And what's your evidence that we can do it? More one million children are studying in good and outstanding schools compared to 2010, so we can deliver, continue to deliver on education. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. Thank you, Tristram. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Sam.